Now, I have the pleasure of introducing Stacy Hausner, and Stacy will introduce the Honorable Judge Rico, uh, Richard Rico. Stacy Feldman Hausner has successfully mediated hundreds of cases in the areas of business, personal injury, employment, real estate, construction defect, insurance coverage, and entertainment law at ADR Services. She has an exceptionally high settlement rate due to her tenacity, keen insight, and friendly demeanor. After a career as a litigator on both the plaintiff and defense sides, Ms. Hausner received an LLM in dispute resolution from the Strauss Institute at Pepperdine University School of Law. She has mediated for the Santa Monica Superior Court, Central District Court, the DFEH, the DCBA, and the Center for Conflict Resolution. She also teaches mediation theory and practice as an adjunct faculty member at Pepperdine University School of Law. Co-teaches mediating the litigating case at Strauss and trains mediators on the Central District Court panel. So without further ado, Stacy, passing it to you. Thank you so much, Hayward. I appreciate that introduction, and I'm very happy to be here with you all today. So in this hour, Judge Rico and I are going to switch our focus to a discussion about how to optimize your settlement outcomes in both private mediations and settlement conferences. I will start by discussing some things you may want to consider when attending a private mediation, and then Judge Rico will do the same with regard to settlement conferences. So let's get started. I think the best way to start is to look at what we can do to enhance our settlement outcome before we even get to the mediation. And as a general rule of thumb, think about the fact that the better prepared you are for the mediation, the better outcome you'll achieve for your client. So you want to know your evidentiary support. You want to understand your BATNA, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Understanding what the other side wants and what evidence the other side will rely upon will help you because your mediator will be asking you to respond to what the other side tells them. Comparative verdicts can be persuasive and helpful as well. And doing a cost risk analysis is beneficial in determining the evaluation of a good settlement of your case. Um, you might want to do decision trees, but really take a look at that. Um, keep in mind always that you want to persuade the other side to evaluate the case similar to your evaluation. And that way you'll get a better settlement result for your client. When appropriate, you also want to think about setting conditions to the process. So if you think the other side's wasting your time by going to the mediation or is trying to go on an information gathering um, hunt, you might want to say to them, look, I'll mediate with you if you start your first offer at $500,000. Or maybe you want to say that I don't want to discuss certain issues. Um, I won't mediate unless you have a certain person attend the mediation. You can put conditions on the process to mediation. So if you find there to be a strategic advantage in doing so, that you know, all the power to you. Also, if someone puts a condition on the process for you, I would recommend from an advocacy standpoint that you do the same to them. So if they say, look, I'm not coming to the mediation unless you drop your demand to 500,000, you may want to respond with, okay, I'll drop mine to 500,000, but you need to come in at 100,000. And now you've bracketed the mediation and, and postured for your client more advantageously. Also, you want to think about preparing your client for the mediation, because so many times we see that a client can be an obstacle to settlement. So get, you know, 95% of cases settle. So you want to get your client prepared that mediation will be the culminating event. Um, so that, you know, especially if they've been living with the dispute for a while, this may be the first opportunity that someone neutral outside the dispute is involved. Get them ready to put the, the dispute behind them. Also, you want to get your client to understand your role in a negotiation, in the mediation. So in trial, you're going to be a zealous advocate. You're going to be combative and positional and, you know, all those skills we learn in law school. But in mediation, it's a little bit different. You're going to be a collaborator, a problem solver, and you do better for your client if you really sit and evaluate the risks um, and the weaknesses in your case so that you can get a real true good settlement value. So letting them know of the role will, will stop you from having to show off in front of your client or um, 
look at, then look for a more combative uh, response from you. Also, you want to um, talk to the client about the role you want them to take in the mediation. If you have a sophisticated client, great. Maybe they're at the forefront of the entire conversation. Uh, mediators are going to want to talk to your client because we know psychologically it's beneficial for them to have this kind of day in court feeling. But And if that's the case, talk to them about what information you want them to share and what to hold back to later in the the mediation. A lot of mediation is about information management. So understand what role that will be. If you have a great client, you also may want to consider letting the other side talk to your client in a joint session. In Los Angeles, it's it's atypical to have a joint session. People want to be in caucus, stay in caucus, but there may be an advantage at some point in the mediation if you have a particularly good client for, for doing that joint. Um, also, who needs to be there? If you're a plaintiff attorney and your client is scared or indecisive, they may need a support person there, a spouse, a child sometimes we see, or a parent. Um, so keep that in mind that, that the people that need to be there are there. Also decision makers, Zoom has been fantastic. We get people from all over the country now at the mediation. Think about um, who you want to be listening to it. Also authority is important. Um, if you had an, for example, if you had an employment case, maybe a sexual harassment case, you may or may not want the, the supervisor who did the harassing there. Um, it, you might be able to have more candid conversations if the, the supervisor is not there. Or on the other hand, maybe the supervisor needs to be there to do <clears throat> what really happens. So keep that in mind when you're deciding who to, should attend the mediation. Also with the mediation, I think it, before you even get there, I think it's important you speak with your mediator. I always do what we call a pre-mediation caucus, I call counsel. And the reason is, is because I want to identify potential obstacles to settlement, potential options for settlement. I want to explore the dynamic between the parties or between the lawyer and their client. It's an opportunity for a lawyer to talk to me without the presence of their client. And so they can reveal to me maybe some problems with the relationship maybe some sensitive issues that the client wouldn't want the mediator to speak about in front of them. Um, it really is advantageous. For example, the other day, um, I was speaking to a lawyer who said, look, every time I say anything, the defense automatically discounts it. But if you it comes out of the mouth of the co-defendant, they can hear it. Well, that's very advantageous for me because right at the outset, I know how I want a message. So these types of dynamics can be very useful. We can understand creative resolutions and if they're possible. So keep that in mind. I think it's a great idea. If your mediator doesn't call you, I think it's a great idea to give your mediator a call prior to the mediation. Another thing I just want to mention briefly, it's protected by confidentiality. And you may, the issues that resolve in your favor, I would try to speak about first. Um, they become kind of the, the center of the mediation and the other issues become more peripheral to it. So even if you're a defendant and you have a cross claim, if you can, and the other side will do it, try to get the conversations around your claim against them. I think you'll do better in the negotiation. Sharing your mediation brief. So many of you attorneys don't like to share your mediation brief, and you'll notice that most of us mediators, we try to get you to share them. The reason we do this is not only that it saves time, um, because the other side has the general gist of your argument, but we think it enhances your presence at the mediation. If the other side is hearing an argument for the very first time from our mouths, they are likely to discount it, especially if they've shared the brief from you. Also, if decision makers are not in the room, like if you have an insurance company on the other side, they're coming to the mediation with a level of authority. So give the people who are involved in that decision making um, an opportunity to see your evidence and your argument. Get them your documentation. If it's an insurance company, they're not going to be giving you money for damages if you don't have some support. So get them your medical records. Get them your report, um, things like that, so that they can um, use that in their determination of evaluation of the case. Because remember, you're trying to get them to evaluate the case similar to how you see the case. Uh, keep that in mind. When you think of what to put in the brief, we're looking for a big picture. You don't need to show them every argument. So many lawyers say, I don't want to show my, my hand. Well, don't. 
keep some of the arguments to yourself. Don't give them your smoking guns. You can give those to the mediator separately. Um, that, that's um, advantageous for you as well. But giving them the general gist of where you're coming from is beneficial. So there's a great book by Robert Cialtini called Influence, Science, and Practice. And he teaches negotiators how to get what you want. And if you're interested in more detail about this, I have a bunch of articles on my website about it. Um, and I can do a more lengthy MCLE for a law firm or a bar association on the advantages, the techniques you can use for negotiation. But one thing he talks about is likability. People give more to people they like. And we know 95% of cases settle. So it's a great idea to make opposing counsel like you, or at least respect you. Um, grant discovery requests when possible. Um, uh, work with them on scheduling. Uh, you know, if you're about to head to a big, into big lengthy litigation, maybe take opposing counsel out for coffee. I mean, I've been in a mediation where one side has said, you know what, the other lawyer is so reasonable. If he's saying this is the valuation of the case, then this is what the case is worth. And we settled that, that number. So it has a very strong impact. Parties are already not getting along. So if you can get along with opposing counsel, it's a great idea. Um, anchoring. So when you get to the mediation, a lot of lawyers say, well, where should I start? What's my starting number? And then what, how should I make my concessions? So anchoring, this anchoring effect says that people look at numbers in relation to earlier numbers given. So let me give you an example. If you were to go into a camera store and the sign said camera $1,000 on sale for $600, you are more inclined to buy that camera than if the sign just said camera $600. And marketers know this. A lot of lawyers know this. And so they want to make these extreme opening numbers. We call them anchors. And they will they say, well, then by the time I get to the number, I really am willing to settle it that the other side will look at it as a gain. And say, look how much money I made during this mediation. And there's truth to that. They've done a lot of studies on that. But the problem is if you go too extreme, the other side's going to be insulted. And then they're going to engage in what we call negative negotiating behavior. And we don't want that. So we need to find that sweet spot between high enough or low enough um, so that you can make concessions because you know your mediator is gonna try to make you compromise, um, but not so high or low that you get, you engender this bad negotiating behavior. Mediations resolve at the midpoint of the first reasonable offer and the first reasonable demand, not the anchoring initial offers. And there's even studies that show that the person who makes the first reasonable offer has a negotiation advantage. So consider making the first re reasonable offer. Um, if your client makes you give a really large anchor or you really want to, um, you might want to attach it to damages so that when the mediator goes in to explain it and try to soften the impact of it to the other side, they can have something to talk about, like the damages. Um, you also could add creative terms so that you muck it all up. So let's use the employment example. Um, maybe you're only willing to offer 10,000 as your opening number, but you say, look, I can help find you a job or write you a positive recommendation um, for a future employment or something like that. Um, so that they can't, the impact of that that very extreme anchor um, lessons a little bit. Who goes first? Some lawyers make a big deal about this in the mediation. I've noticed, I don't think it really makes a, much of a deal. You might wanna think about this. If you go first, you're making the first concession. That can be a good thing. Um, and if you go second, you have an ability to learn about where they're going and to adjust accordingly. Chris Voss is an amazing negotiator. He's a hostage negotiator. He does a master class, if any of you are members of that, um, on negotiation. He writes a book. Uh, he wrote a book, Never Split the Difference. It's fantastic. Um, and he also does a blog. He says, never go first. Um, because you want to learn information and respond accordingly. That's not always relevant in a mediation, but it's something to consider. Concession. So this is the compromises we're asking you to make. Be aware that concessions send messages, okay? So if you go really big jump right off the bat, the other side's going to read that as meaning you have a lot of room to move. Okay, so, you know, a, a smaller pattern of concessions may be beneficial. You might want to come in at a better anchoring number, less extreme, and then make small moves. 
um, if you stop making concessions and then start offering creative uh, resolutions, the other side will interpret that to mean you're out of money. So that might be a good strategy to take, right? Or um, slow it down a little bit if you need to save some ground. Never give a concession without one in return. Um, otherwise, you're negotiating against yourself. Most law of you lawyers know that. If you accompany a request for a concession with information, you're more likely to get what you want. And that's back to Robert Cialdini. He says, the more information you get, give, the more likely someone is to comply with your request. So most of us need mediators. <clears throat> and as we ask you for concessions, we come in um, with more information. So keep that in mind. If your mediator's not doing that, maybe you'll help them do that by holding back some of the information. Save some concessions for the end. We're going to be pushing you to close the deal. So even when you are saying you're towards your bottom line, have a little bit more room to go because that might be what needs to happen to get the deal done. Never take a backward step. Sometimes you guys get so upset because the other side hasn't moved enough. I um, mean, you say, well, I'm going backwards or I'm not moving. Um, that's just going to make the other side engage in poor negotiating behavior. And we want them to be giving generous negotiating behavior because that gets our client a better outcome. So we don't want to take any actions during this um, that could hurt that. And talk to your mediator about that. Us mediators are trained in negotiation as well. So we can serve as kind of negotiation coaches. Um, so talk to us about that. Talk about what messages you want us to convey as, as we deliver information and extract further concessions and move you towards settlement. Um, how many concessions to make? That just depends on the litigation, what's happening with the other side, your relationship with the mediator. Um, we're not going to let the negotiation get stale. We're going to use some of our tricks and tips and tools. Um, so uh, talk to your mediator about that. If, if the pattern's moving too slowly, we have ways that we can speed it up, and we often do. Should you reveal your bottom line to the mediator? Okay. So the answer is it really helps us. So anytime somebody tells me the bottom line early on, that makes my life so much easier because I'm looking for zone of potential agreement, so ZOPA. So when I know where everyone's going, it's really easy for me to get that set on, and that's great. From an advocacy perspective, I wouldn't really do that or I wouldn't reveal a true bottom line. And the reason I wouldn't is because that's where we are trying to bring the negotiation when we hear it or in that range. I would let your mediator work for a better number for your client. So if you feel the need to say something, I'd give yourself room off the number that you give as your bottom line. And it does go against my interest to tell you this, but I think from an advocacy perspective, it is advantageous. Be flexible. <clears throat> Um, let us, you know, we'll try everything we can to get this case settled for you. So sometimes we want to change up the process and move you into joint session, maybe bring the lawyers together for a nuanced discussion. If we think the law is the obstacle to settlement, we may want to bring defendants to get to work together. Um, if that's what we see as being the obstacle to settlement, maybe we think the other side needs to see how great your client is. And so we wanna bring you all into a joint session because your articulate client will be able to impress the other side. So um, just be flexible with it. We wouldn't, I would never change processes without talking to the lawyers and coaching the lawyers on it. So just keep it in mind. Um, in terms of, of being flexible in the approach. Also be open to different tools we wanna to use. Um, we have a, a whole list, we frame things a certain way. Um, we may wanna bracket, I know some lawyers don't like brackets, but if it's a, the negotiations getting stale, um, you might wanna be open to that. Sometimes we use an objective framework to determine valuations that can be beneficial, hypothetical offers. At the end of the day, if, you know, a mediator proposal sometimes can be what it takes to get the deal done. So keep those in mind. Talk to your mediator. Um, listen to what your mediator is talking about because we're talking about what the other side thinks their strongest arguments are. So if the case doesn't settle, that's what they're going to be talking about at the in, at trial or that's what they're going to be asking your client about in the deposition. We're foreshadowing for you this 
how the other side sees the case. So this is very informational for you, even if you don't settle. And while the mediator is in the other room, oftentimes I'll actually give some homework to one room while I'm working with the other. So even in a mediation the other day, one side was making a big deal about um, the licenses uh, related to a DBA. And so while I was in one room, I said, okay, pull up your corporate documents. Let's see the filing dates of these licenses. So let the mediator help you get the information. Uh, your, your client's being asked to make a very big decision and to put this, you know, they've invested typically time and money into the dispute. And so we got to get them information. So use your mediator, get you the information you need. I'll say, what do you want to hear from the other side? Because I want to know what could change your perspective or maybe move your evaluation of the case. So use your mediator in this way. We can be very beneficial. Okay, confidentiality. This can be a conversation an hour on its own. Um, it is kind of a mess in California. And part of it is because that these issues don't get litigated in the courts. What we do know is that California Evidence Code sections 1115 through 1128 and federal rule of evidence, they say that everything said or written in a mediation is, is confidential. It cannot be admitted into evidence. <clears throat> So we do know that, um, but where there are a lot of limitations on this doctrine. First of all, it does not protect information from discovery. So if you are not past your discovery cutoff date when you're at the mediation, people can take discovery about it. So if your client reveals he or she has offshore bank accounts, the other side cannot say, didn't you say in the mediation you have offshore bank accounts? But what your client can say what they can do is they can propound written discovery about all your offshore bank accounts or ask you about it in a deposition. So keep that in mind when you're revealing that information. Also confidentiality doesn't apply to criminal proceedings. So if you have fraud allegations or there could be a subsequent criminal prosecution or investigation, be careful with what you reveal in the mediation. Um, confidentiality does not make information private. That means you, the other side can leave the mediation, go tell the press about it. They could go tell their friends. They could tell your competitors about it. Um, if you're concerned about this, I would recommend that you draft a strict confidentiality agreement that essentially makes everything said private because the laws of confidentiality don't go far enough for you in that regard. Us mediators would never talk about it because we also have ethical rules and um, we don't talk about anything that's said or done or attach it to people or parties um, from a mediation, but the other side could. So be careful if you're worried about that. Um, we don't know if confidentiality, if communications can be used for impeachment. Um, that's never been litigated. So we just don't know if it's strong enough. Um, the guys earlier spoke about, if you went to the ethics portion this morning, they spoke about the Cassell case. You are now required to get in writing from your clients. Um, and I knew you have to put in writing that mediations are confidential. Uh, and they spoke in detail about that. Choice of law. Um, this is very interesting. Every state has different confidentiality protections. And now we are on Zoom with people all over the country. What state is going to govern? We just don't know. What if the communication was made in Illinois and the case is filed in California, but the other disputant is in, in, in Canada? I, we just don't know what's going to govern. It's never been litigated. So keep that in mind that every state has different statutes. Um, so things to, things to think about when you're thinking about confidential, if you are concerned about information getting released outside the confines of the mediation, pay attention to some of these limitations. Consider bridging impasse with creative resolution. So it, there's this book, Getting to Yes, a lot of you may know about this book, but it's saying, 
you know, underneath all the positions people take are goals and interests and the why. And us mediators, we're looking to see if we can bridge impasse. Mediations tend to start with that fixed pie distributed bargaining. And then we're looking to see if we can add some creative resolution to bridge an impasse or maybe to even stand on its own. So one thing we look to do is we trade off underlying interests. So everybody prioritizes things differently. Let's say you have, you love your distributorship of widgets in Argentina and the other side loves their distributorship of widgets in Canada. We may say, okay, you get exclusive rights in Argentina and the other side will have exclusive rights in Canada. That would be a trade-off of interest based on different priorities. We also are looking for overlapping interests. So for example, most both of you may be concerned about your reputation. And so what we're gonna be looking for is maybe a resolution that could, could, could satisfy both of your needs, like a joint press release or a ribbon cutting ceremony, something like that. And so we're, we're asking a lot of the why questions to, to explore whether or not we can have a future business relationship, potentially a future work relationship. Um, payment plans are always a great way if the defendant just doesn't have the money right now. Um, apologies sometimes people want when there's a lot of ego or hurt feelings involved um, and we can get them in joint session for that. Work performance, um, even if there's a lack of trust, um, sometimes we can get a third party neutral person to make sure that the work performance is in accordance with standards or something like that. So us mediators, we have a lot of experience in this. We can be helpful, but also you can help by sharing that with your mediator. And these are great ways to bridge any gap um, and allow for settlement. Also objective framework, if you're working with the same numbers and you just have different valuations, maybe a third party accountant that you both can agree on will determine uh, what the value of the case is worth and, and will allow for settlement. So just keep this in mind, work with your mediators. Never sleep on a deal. Memorialize all material terms in writing if you can, even if that means you know, you're there for an extra hour. It's helpful to bring a draft settlement agreement to the mediation um, that and start working on that with opposing counsel when you get or start getting close. Um, but you, you know, people sleep on it and then they say, why did the other side agree? I must not have done as well as I could have. I don't, this isn't good. They'll, or they'll think of an argument they forgot or a, a term they forgot. So get the material terms in writing before you leave the mediation. And we're even doing that in Zoom. So, so we're able to do that for you. Um, some just general negotiation tips. Um, time pressured offers are, are good, strong, persuasive impact. Back to Robert Cialdini. Um, he says that um, the, any, anything in scarce supply is more desired. So at the end of the day, mediation settle when you're out of time. A lot of lawyers know this and the offer is good only for today. Or if they need board approval, it's good till Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever it may be. Um, it's going to be less persuasive to keep an offer open indefinitely. Um, when I do a mediator's proposal, I oftentimes will put a time limit on that as well to invoke some of this scarcity impact. Contingency agreements are great. They derive value for the risk taker. You see this like in a sports contract with bonuses. If you get to the playoffs, you're entitled to this much more money. When people are worried about something happening, you can build that into the agreement and say, well, if this happens, I had this in a um, neighbor dispute and a garage was built over the property line and she was worried about an earthquake. Well, if, if the earthquake happens and you have the right to rebuild over the proper line, otherwise, um, you, you know, should there be any remodel, the garage has to move on to your lot, on, into your property. Use power to your advantage. A better alternative to a negotiated agreement gives you a lot of power. Um, knowing more about the case gives you more power because you have a response to everything. Um, money can do it. Relationships can do it. There's power dynamics in relationships. So use power to your advantage when negotiating. You just don't want to use it too much that you intimidate the other side um, and they feel threatened and want to withdraw or not engage in good negotiating behavior. Avoiding argument dilution. We all learn that, I think, in law school and pretty much know that. If you give 20 arguments, the other side's going to only listen to your last two, your weakest two, and ignore all the others. So you want to parcel those out strong with your, start with your strong arguments. Us media 
mediators and actually help you with that. So that's an advantage of having a mediator. The more you explain, the more you're going to get what you want. So be like, be communicative with your mediator. That because I said so isn't isn't the most persuasive um, argument for us getting you what you can get. And rule of reciprocity. Um, Generous negotiating behavior is going to beget generous negotiating behavior on the other side. We have a social obligation to pay a favor with a favor. And so keep that in mind. If you're nice to the other side, they're going to be nice back. Um, it's very simple. That's Robert Cialdini also. Um, and then good faith negotiations are never a waste of time. So use your mediator. E First of all, it's not a waste of time because you're learning about the case um, and, and hopefully getting closer to settlement. Even if the case doesn't settle now, it may settle light, later. Um, use your mediator if it doesn't settle to help you. Tell them when it would be a good time to check up. Um, you know, Maybe there's a dispositive motion or a big deposition that needs to take place. And we can circle back and, and keep trying to settle the case for you. Um, let us give you a mediator's proposal if that'll help. Um, and at, the very least we can help with you know scheduling and stipulations on documents things like that so we can be you can use us to your advantage even if the case doesn't settle right then and there on that day all right and here's um a one tip one to uh, one sheet of tips i know you're not gonna be able to read it it's kind of small but i have some, a couple of sheets of negotiating tips if you would like me to send it to you please just email me i'm happy to send it out or to discuss it with you you can call me as well i love topic talking about these things all right well thank you so much for listening to me and now we get the great pleasure of listening to Judge Richard Rico. He was appointed by Governor Gray Davis to the Los Angeles Superior Court in October 1999. He retired in March of 2020. As an attorney, he was a partner in the civil litigation firm of Breidenbach, Swainston, Chris Bowen Way. And just prior to being appointed to the bench, he was a research attorney for the California Court of Appeal. The last 11 years on the bench, he presided over an IC court at the Stanley Moss Courthouse in Los Angeles. So take it away, Judge Rico. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Stacy. I uh, appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, attending this. Um, and I can't help but mention the fact that, uh, as uh, I've heard since I was a young adult, uh, you live in interesting times. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, every time I hear that, I think things cannot get more interesting, but somehow they do. Uh, and I don't mean this presentation today. I'm sure you all are aware of what's going on. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, um, move on to some more mundane topics. Um, back when I was in college, uh, we talked about the uh, freshman 10, the 10 pounds you gained uh, living in college. And uh, also for some reason, my hair seemed to have gotten longer then. And I guess there's a repetition uh, right now of the uh, what we're going through. I, I have avoided the COVID-10, I must say. Uh, I've gotten a lot of exercise, but uh, for some reason, my hair has grown uh, a bit. Uh, Maybe you call it the COVID three inches or four inches, whatever. Um, I'm not sure what it says. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm afraid to cut my own hair or just too loyal to my barber. But uh, eventually the barbershop will open and I will get my hair cut. Uh, but anyway, I'm here to talk to you this afternoon about settlement conferences. Uh, settlement conferences before judges. Uh, since uh, I've just recently left the bench. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what your options are, and maybe you can decide what your best options are based upon the type of case you have, your parties, uh, uh, the issues involved. Uh, I can say briefly uh, a bit of historical background back when I was a, a young attorney uh, starting out. Uh, settlement conferences were a bit more ad hoc. Uh, I remember back when I started out that uh, settlement conferences were something you did like the day or two before uh, the date set for trial. You'd have an MSC. Uh, uh, the judge would tell you to bring your clients and people with authority present to the, at the settlement conferences, at the settlement conference. And uh, indeed, uh, you had no thoughts about, well, you may have had some qualms about whether or not the uh, trial judge was going to act as your 
uh, settlement uh, conference judge, but uh, that's the way things were done back then. Uh, of course, uh, over, over the years, things progressed. Uh, there were certain judges, uh, particularly in the Los Angeles Superior Court, uh, who uh, gained reputations as being very good settlement judges. And so you'd make, your, uh, make an effort to uh, make arrangements with the clerk uh, of the particular judge and uh, get your case uh, scheduled, uh, calendared for uh, one of these judges who you felt comfortable with. And uh, then the next major change came about uh, following the 2008 recession, when uh, the budgetary constraints uh, helped to uh, encourage the creation of an actual settlement department. Uh, now, the following I'll say with a caveat that this is all uh, pre-COVID. Uh, obviously, things have changed a bit since then. But uh, it's my expectation, and I believe it's the expectation of the court that uh, once uh, things return to normal, we'll go back to the procedure that was in place uh, when I left the bench back in March. But uh, as you know, uh, those of you in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles Superior Court, we have a uh, dedicated department, uh, settlement department with dedicated judges who's uh, assignment is indeed to hold settlement conferences. Uh, coming from an IC court, uh, it was the understanding that, uh, and as well as I and my fellow uh, uh, former colleagues, would um, basically ask the attorneys and, and to, if they wish to attend a settlement conference with one of these, uh, set, one of these settlement courts, and uh, if so, to make, make the appropriate scheduling. Sometimes this will take a month or two, but uh, you would have a settlement conference uh, set uh, before one of the settlement judges uh, with all the formalities that the uh, settlement, the MSC procedure, mandatory settlement conference procedure uh, dictates. Uh, you know, clients present, people with authority present, trial attorneys present, uh, confidential uh, briefs to be filed in a timely fashion, and uh, you would have a uh, settlement conference before uh, one of these judges. Um, there were still, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of alternatives to that. Or one of the alternatives would be that uh, because of the, the more formal procedure of uh, having a case signed to a settlement court, it would take some time. Sometimes you would have last minute requests to have a settlement conference in which case <clears throat> your uh, trial judge may uh, look to either one of his colleagues, his or her colleagues, one of his, his or her friends uh, who would be available to conduct a settlement conference at short notice. Um, and uh, it was sort of expected in, in, uh, that uh, if you were not in trial, you got such a phone call, you would uh, help, help out your uh, colleague and conduct a settlement conference. And then the third option of his course is to have the uh, trial court, the, the, the judge who uh, is going to be conducting the trial to actually serve as a settlement court uh, and conduct the settlement conference. Uh, over the years, it's, uh, that procedure has also become a little bit more formalized in that uh, you will usually have the uh, attorneys and parties sign a waiver uh, so that they completely understand that uh, Indeed, the settlement conference will be performed by the trial uh, court uh, and that uh, everything is confidential, but that, not, and that the trial court is, is, uh, has the ability to uh, render opinions, discuss evidence, discuss uh, case evaluations uh, without being subject to any uh, attempt to disqualify the judge under a 170.6. Uh, procedure. Um, <clears throat> so let me talk to you about a, uh, a bit uh, of uh, what I did uh, as a judge. Uh, and I, I'd like to take advantage of all really, quite frankly, all three of those options. Uh, again, it was depending on the case. Uh, if it was a regular, uh, because I, had, I conducted an IC court, and indeed, this, this is true of all the other judges, all, all my colleagues. Uh, who uh, handle IC courts. And for those of you who don't are unfamiliar with the uh, 
What that means, it's an individual calendar court. That meant the judges uh, had the case from initial filings to the end to, uh, to trial if it went that far. Uh, so we, uh, if you handled an IC court, you'd become very familiar with the, uh, the case. You'd become familiar with the attorneys as they would come in with various status conferences, the motions that were heard, you would take care of those matters. <clears throat> so you became quite familiar with, with the case. And as a result, uh, I felt that I was able to gauge which procedure might be the best uh, in the best interest of the parties to help uh, resolve the case. Uh, the more run-of-the-mill case, indeed, I would uh, at some point close to trial, but not, not on the eve of trial, send them to one of the settlement courts uh, unless there was some reason uh, why uh, it was clear that that would, was not an option. But for the most part, I would send them to the settlement courts uh, with the expectation that the parties would in good faith negotiate with the settlement judges and uh, reach some resol uh, resolution. I mean, as Stacy mentioned, uh, you know, 95%, even, even more uh, cases settle. So, so that's one way to uh, take care of the calendar. Um, there were cases, however, where the attorneys would ask me if I would serve as a settlement judge. Uh, I would be quite willing to do that as long as both sides agreed. And they, of course, signed the appropriate waivers. Uh, there could be, there would be reasons uh, why an attorney might want the trial court to act as a settlement court. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of timing. Uh, they feel that they could, uh, the trial judge was familiar with the case. Maybe it involves some complicated law and motion matters that the judge had already handled. And uh, you, they would not need to, to take that time to uh, uh, get the uh, settlement judge up to speed as to what's going on. Um, also, quite frankly, there may be some interest in uh, informing the judge of what things might go on at trial, maybe to get some uh, inkling of what might happen with the court's rulings in terms of motions in limine, uh, and those kind of matters. And again, as a settlement judge, I even in a case that I was trying, I had no problem with that. Uh, the more information, the better. Obviously, as a trial judge, you'd rather know as much information as possible uh, going into a trial uh, rather than spend uh, time uh, when a jury's uh, sitting in the jury box to uh, try and rule on matters that uh, could be of quite significance to the case. Um, and then the third option would be sort of the, the last minute uh, settlement conferences that come about where either the parties have already attended a settlement conference or some sort of mediation, or they had declined these various offers to conduct settlement conferences until the last minute somebody has seen the light and uh, asked that uh, uh, at some 11th hour that a settlement conference be held. And in which case, uh, you know, I usually had uh, some friends of mine who uh, would be willing to uh, take the uh, settlement conference at the last minute. Um, and indeed, uh, I was also on the receiving end on the other side where I would at the last minute that uh, one of my uh, friends would call me and say, hey, can you take this case? They, they, they've all of a sudden seen the light. They think they want to settle. Uh, if you have time, you're not in trial, could you take it? And of course, uh, we would all do that. Uh, uh, we were all very willing to, uh, uh, all of my colleagues there in, at Stanley Mosque were more than happy to help our, our colleagues. And indeed, uh, as, as time over the years, as a, uh, as a judge, uh, I, I, I think I enjoyed taking other uh, judges' cases to handle uh, as a settlement judge. It made things a little bit easier for me uh, I felt I had more uh, arrows in the quiver, as it were, to try and attempt to uh, settle the case uh, based upon the, the various posture of the, the attorneys, the parties, the type of case involved. Um, and again, uh, this is something that you should think about when you, uh, uh, if you are going to uh, attempt to resolve a case through the settlement conference program uh, at the courts. Um, and the, again, it's not just the attorneys, but also the clients. Uh, uh, 
uh, I enjoyed, I would always, uh, when I was conducting a settlement conference, uh, first of all, I would always, first of all, bring in both sides of the, both sides into chambers, have a brief discussion, try to get a lay of the land, where are the parties, what, are, what conversations have gone on up to that point, uh, where they stand, uh, before I then break out into the one-on-one -on -one sessions with, uh, with each side. Um, when I would uh, talk to the, uh, each side, I inevitably I would always uh, have the client in along with the attorney uh, to, discuss, to discuss the case. Because again, uh, you wanna ensure that the uh, client has a, a full buy-in on the, on the program. Client has been listened to, uh, which is extremely important uh, when you're trying to resolve a case, uh, particularly when you're not talking about institutional clients, where you're talking about individuals who, on either side, whether it's the plaintiff or defendant, uh, these uh, the parties need to be heard. They want to have an opportunity to be heard, and I, I've always found it quite beneficial to be able to talk to the the other side. Um, I will be upfront with them. I will tell them uh, as we go through the, uh, in my initial conversations, I said, um, particularly when it is a case that I am not going to be the trial judge, I will say that uh, I will explain that uh, I'm a trial judge, just like judge so-and-so who may try the case, your case. Uh, and uh, we do the same kind of work. We have had cases similar to yours, uh, but I'm here trying to help that judge settle this case. Um, but as a result, um, you may hear things you might not want to hear from me, but I'm going to tell you uh, what I think about the case. Uh, and again, you may not agree with it, but uh, please understand that I'm going to listen to your, you. And I'm also going to bring in the other side. I'm going to listen to what the other side has to say. And if, uh, if I, I will tell the other side the same thing. I might not agree with that other side or what they have to say but I will try and be upfront with you to see if you can reach a resolution uh, based upon what I've heard and I'll help you um, steer towards that uh, goal. Um, sometimes I see it as, a, as an instance of, uh, uh, again, depending on the parties and depending on the case, uh, I would call it uh, benign indifference. I, I would tell them, look, Try here to try to help you, but uh, if the case doesn't settle, not my problem. You'll go to trial, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes that brings uh, a little uh, reality to the parties at times. So, uh, but again, uh, I, uh, it, it it really was something that uh, uh, I enjoyed, kind of gauging which is the best posture to try and resolve the case. Um, so uh, I, I think that brings us to some issues that, that would be of interest to the attorneys uh, who are looking to uh, try and reach a settlement uh, through uh, the judicial program. Um, certainly you want to, uh, many of the, the, the issues that Stacy mentioned are, I, I absolutely agree with in terms of preparation preparation for discussion, the various options that uh, might be available based upon your case. Um, uh, and I think that really does come in handy because there, are, there, are, there were many conferences where, uh, where it was a situation where you couldn't resolve the case solely based on just a monetary value, reach a value, reach some sort of agreement as to the amount that they would take to settle the case and you settle the case. Many times the most difficult cases to resolve, of course, were those where uh, for one reason or another, uh, that monetary figure could not be reached. And uh, if, you, if you wanna try and settle the case where you're being more creative, whether it's payments over time or it's some sort of uh, real estate transactions or, or, or some sort of uh, estate issues or family matters where uh, you're talking about property and maybe some sort of uh, division of property or properties, um, these things become more complicated. So it, it would be in the attorney's best interest to 
think about those matters, think about what the possibilities might be uh, and really uh, make some attempt. I think as, as Stacy mentioned before, um, you know, coming up with some sort of a settlement agreement in advance, or at least the outlines of a possible uh, settlement agreement. Think of what the, the issues might be uh, and see if you can do that in advance so that when the negotiations reach that point where the, the final details are needed, uh, that you can, uh, you at least have a head start towards uh, getting that resolution. Um, and I think I, I saw Haywood there. So I, I think we're at a point where I can stop now. And, uh, and again, I, as uh, everyone's mentioned, I'm free to, you're free to talk to me about these things. Yeah. You can get in touch with me here through ADR, but they would. Yes, thank you, Judge Rico, and thank you, Stacy. Um, so we do have some time for some questions. Um, since uh, you, well, let me start off by asking you, Judge Rico. So when agreeing to having your case judge act as your settlement judge, does it matter if it's a bench trial or a jury trial? Well, um, as a general principle, we would not conduct a uh, settlement conference uh, for a bench trial, uh, just because it becomes that that is extremely that's a very narrow uh, needle or thread, because you want to be able to talk to the parties uh, honestly and give your opinion. But if it becomes, uh, it's then very difficult to then have to decide usually one side or the other. And then if you did you if you're the trial judge, you're going to have to decide one side or the other. For the most part, and the side that's losing says we'll we'll go away thinking, well, the judge never uh, uh, was always biased towards me, even from the beginning of our settlement conversations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, rarely, if ever, would a trial judge on a bench trial perform his own his or her own settlement conference. A jury trial, that's different. Jury gets to decide those things, but a bench trial, yes, very difficult. Very difficult. not that it hasn't happened, but very very difficult. And uh, Stacy, so we have a question for you. Um, this attendee says, I feel that mediations have a certain rhythm and can tell the likelihood of resolution based on this as the time moves along. Do you ever consider quote unquote rhythm as a critical part of resolution of a case? Uh, the answer is absolutely. And so as the concessions are going along, when the, when the energy gets low and the rhythm is not working well, that's when you'll see mediators try to bracket or to change the discussion, the focus of the discussion. But absolutely, if the rhythm's good and everybody's engaging in good negotiating behavior, or generous moves, and I see that they're moving towards one another, absolutely, I, I'm thinking we're moving towards settlement. So I, I'm monitoring all of that as well. It's a good point. Perfect. And an open question. So should the mediator weigh the evidence and come to its own valuation and or potential risk exposure analysis in order to push each side appropriately? Or is the mediator just facilitating dollar movements in demands and offers? I, I, I can jump in on that. Um, there is a time in many mediations where it is advantageous for us to give an evaluation. Um, we're looking to what can we do, what tools can we use to help get this case settled? And oftentimes an opinion is important. Um, and so when it is, we can jump right in there with that. Sometimes we'll give an opinion as to the whole case. Sometimes it's as to an issue. Sometimes it as is as to the process. But if it's gonna have some persuasive impact and help for resolution, absolutely. What do you think, Judge? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, you learn through experience and uh, there are times when, if it's the right case at the right time, you absolutely do it. If, if it's a matter of just basically getting somebody off their position where they're stuck in concrete and you feel that it's quite frankly, not a legitimate position, then you, you do try and move them off uh, to get the ball rolling. Uh, but yes, uh, again, it's not for every case, but, but you, you know when it's the right time. Uh, yeah. A good mediator, a good settlement judge knows, knows that point. I think we have a time for a couple more questions. Um, 
any insight into reason why a plaintiff's counsel makes a very high demand and then moves very little during the mediation? Um, this attendee says, I find this often signals an attorney or lawyer who does not know his or her case. Do you have any insights into those? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all negotiation strategy for what it's worth. I think <clears throat> very high, I was talking about that anchoring number because they want the other side when they get to the final oh to look at it as a game. They also know their messaging. So they think if they're moving very little, that maybe that'll have some impact on where the final settlement number is. Um, the truth is that just may not, that might be right at, way outside the range of where defense is willing to go. And so as mediators, we're trying to get them to reevaluate. If they, if they don't understand the case, that's our job as mediators to help them understand it. Right. I, I mean, it's a it's a posture that that uh, uh, attorneys take. And uh, again, as a mediator or settlement officer, you uh, uh, you know, at some point you have a heart to heart talk. It says, well, you know, I said, well, we'll be here all day. If you're at zero and you're at a million, okay, we can go at hundred dollar, thousand dollars, ten thousand dollar increments. I'm I'm here. I'm I tell them I'm getting paid, so let's go. Uh, but if indeed people are, are convinced that uh, one side is convinced that it's a million dollar case and the other side is a, convinced that it's a zero case and nobody's gonna budge, then I say, okay, trial's in 10 days. <laughs> see you then. Yep, see you then. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. What is objective framework to determine valuation? Do you, Judge, do you want to go first on this one? No, I don't actually. <laughs> I, well, I I'm not about, sure I understand the question. <laughs> okay, well, I talked about that that's a way to get to settlement. So for example, I had an insurance commission dispute and everybody was working on the same numbers um, and they understood what commissions should be considered. But when we were looking at future calculations, we determined we'll go out five years as opposed to 10. And then when they would do the calculations, they were just way off. And so we, to resolve the case, we um, agreed to an accountant that would run the numbers, that was familiar with the industry and would run the numbers. And everyone agreed that they would accept that number. It was gonna be briefed and submitted, but we were, we had developed a whole framework for that. Um, similarly, if with construction defect, a plaintiff says, look, it's gonna cost me a million to get this repaired. Devence says they can do it with $100,000, um, maybe we we get an objective person to determine what the real, you know, we agree to a different contractor to come in and decide the that the costs of the repair. So we're, it's a way to find get resolution, even when we're so far apart. And if, if that's the obstacle to settlement, it's so great if we can bridge that because then the case will settle. So there's, there's tools to use objective determinations or people um, to get through some of those obstacles. Okay, so I think that just about does it for us for this session. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Judge Rico. Thank and you thank all for you. listening. It was Ooh. great to be here. Yes. So thank you all for joining us.